When it comes to building a gaming PC, there are lots of easily avoidable mistakes I see people make, be that in the part selection process that then go on to affect their performance later down the line, or actually during the build itself. Which is why in this video, I'll be rounding up some of the most common mistakes I see people make and telling you guys how you can avoid them for a smoother, better performing, better looking gaming PC build. Let's do this. Today's video has been made possible by Intel Gamer Days. Their biggest sale of the year is here with discounts on CPUs, GPUs, and even gaming laptops. Why not harness the power of Intel Arc graphics with XE super sampling for AI enhanced upscaling and built in AV1 encoders for video editing and content creation. Plus with the purchase of a new 13th or 14th gen CPU, GPU, or laptop, you also get a free code for Assassin's Creed Shadows launching this November. Check it out at the first link in the description below. For the purposes of this video, I want to avoid some of the cliche mistakes that you'll find when Googling what not to do when building a gaming PC. We all know that installing fans the wrong way around isn't gonna work, and that forgetting to pop some thermal paste in is typically a bad idea. And instead I want to focus on some of the more nuanced, less visible mistakes people tend to make, which can really impact upon gaming performance and your build as a whole. Now, the the first is picking a CPU and GPU combo that just plainly don't offer great value for money. Now the CPU and GPU combo is where I would start for pretty much all gaming PC builds. Get these two part choices right and you tend to be on to a winner. Now when it comes to gaming, you also want to consider the resolution when selecting this combination. Simply put, at 1080p, your CPU is more likely to be the bottleneck than your GPU. While at 4K, it's typically the GPU doing all of the hard work, meaning you don't have to spend quite as much on your CPU. This is an area where if you maximize value now, you'll see really great savings across the rest of your build. And by picking these two parts early, it then determines what kind of power supply you'll need, what motherboards are available to you to choose from, and what generation of memory you should be selecting for your build. Typically, you'll want to go for an i5 or Ryzen 5 tier processor for more entry-level systems, work through to the Ryzen 7 and i7 lineup for higher-end builds, while i9 and Ryzen 9 chips are reserved for those pushing their build to the absolute maximum and often doing more than just gaming, things like video editing or rendering. It's also worth considering at this stage what games you'll want to play on your build. Now, yes, the more you spend on a CPU and GPU combo, the more gaming performance you'll get in a range of titles. However, some games have specific features that specific CPUs and GPUs are going to be more closely akin to. Some games support FSR only or DLSS only, and that might help you determine what brand of GPU to select for your build. Remember, your build is only really gonna be used for the games that you you want to play. And while having a card that's generally great in everything is always a good idea, sometimes it makes sense to select Intel, AMD or Nvidia parts in your build depending on the title you want to play and any corresponding GPU or CPU accelerated features. So that's a good starting point, but James, I've got a good CPU and GPU, what next? One word, memory. Now I'm not gonna walk through all the parts in this build, but an area that I see to be one of the biggest problems in gaming PC builds is RAM. As you can see from this small selection of what we have in stock, there's a lot of kits to choose from, and all of these kits are in their own way actually quite different. Now take this G-Skill, where's it gone? Now take this Lexar memory, for example. This is 6400 megahertz, has Intel XMB support, and there's a fairly low latency. That's gonna deliver better performance than this Corsair kit, which is only 5600 megahertz and has a higher latency. And as if that wasn't enough, depending on the CPU you buy, you may not be able to use any of this and you may need an older DDR4 RAM kit instead. Now, as far as some easy actionable advice that isn't just a pile of memory, you're gonna want to go for at least 32 gigabytes in most gaming PC builds. Now, if you're spending less than $800 pounds, you would be able to consider 16 gigs. And again, depending on the game you're playing, if you're only playing one title from three years ago, it makes sense to drop the memory down as you're likely not going to need it. But for most builds, 32 gigs is where you want to be. 32 gigs also allows you to easily find kits with two DIMMs, which is going to give you dual channel performance. Dual channel performance basically leverages two RAM DIMMs in a build to increase the memory bandwidth, theoretically doubling the total bandwidth and massively increasing gaming performance. Latency is also a massive piece for DDR5. Don't necessarily go for the fastest kit because the fastest kit, like in this instance, 6,000 
megahertz is CL38. The latency is just as important, if not slightly more, with modern CPUs and memory than the speed itself. Not all 6,000 megahertz kits are made equal. So go for a 32 gig kit with a cast latency of 32 to 34 maximum and a speed of at least 6,000 megahertz or 6,000 mega transfers per second. Wasting money on crap memory is a big mistake I see people make in their gaming PC builds. I've got to clear all the memory up now, which is just fun. In at number three is buying incompatible parts. And I'm not actually talking about DDR4 and a DDR5 memory slot, though that won't work. Instead, I'm talking about parts that simply don't fit inside of one another. All cases come with a few key metrics you'll want to keep an eye on. GPU clearance, CPU liquid cooler clearance, and CPU air cooler clearance. Now the air cooler clearance basically defines how much room there is from the motherboard to the glass or metal side panel. The liquid cooler clearance determines how much room you've got for your radiator, while the GPU clearance determines the amount of space available across the glass side panel, aka the maximum length of GPU that can be installed. Now this case is a great example of where GPU clearance is plentiful. Let's face it, there's no fans that are ever going to be installed at the front, so the GPU can go right up. But let's say, for example, you buy a case with fans pre-installed at the front, and you want to add a radiator at the front too for better CPU temperatures. Sounds good to me, but be careful, because doing so is actually going to reduce the GPU clearance. On a spec page of a case on either the manufacturer's website or a third-party retailer, the GPU clearance is only going to include the case as it comes. It may not include additional fans, and it certainly won't include any room chipped out by radiators. You can see here, if I take the panel off of this build, that the radiator is actually a good chunk of space at the top. Imagine this at the front and the effect that's going to have on your total GPU clearance. Now, another area I see people make mistakes really commonly is actually when it comes to airflow. Now, I don't want to be really basic and simple here and say, you need a case with mesh and you need fans and without fans, you... Yes, it's true. Without fans, you're going to be in trouble. But there's a few key tricks you can use to increase the airflow and fan count in your build without going out and spending a load of money on a pack of brand new fans. One way of doing this is with a radiator and an all-in-one cooler. Large all-in-ones like this 360mm unit not only have the advantage of keeping the CPU cool, something which with modern chips is increasingly, well, more important, but also what they do is add more airflow to your build. You see, these three fans on this system here are actually introducing a greater degree of active exhaust and giving us a neutral pressure with 420 mils pulling out and three pulling in. Similarly, you can do the same thing with cases. Some cases come with fans and some don't. And even if you don't like the fans necessarily that are included, you can hide these away in less visible areas. This is a bad example because everything in this case is, well, visible. But in some chassis, that won't necessarily be the case. A good example of this that I often employ is by picking up an all-in-one cooler and actually hiding an additional three boring, non-aesthetic, non-RGB fans at the top to give a push-pull config. Again, be careful of your clearances, but more fans can do a great deal, not only for temperatures, which in most cases are going to manage okay, even if fan placement isn't quite ideal, but actually to do with noise. You see, the more fans you have in your build, the quieter the build actually becomes. Now, James, that makes no sense. Surely more fans has to be louder than less fans. Well, no, because you're going to control the fan speed through the BIOS or through motherboard software, or for most people, it's all just going to happen automatically. And basically, what happens with fan speed is that they're directly linked to CPU and GPU temperatures. If your CPU temp flies really high, the BIOS will push all your fans that bit quicker. So actually having more means the likelihood they're going to ramp up is not only lower, but if you're manually configuring the speed, you can get them running much slower in the first place. Now, another key mistake I see people make is sort of linked to the airflow point, but it gets more complicated complicated, and that's picking a bad case. Now, this is, again, a bad example of good airflow. Now, yes, it's fine. You've got some intake at the back, but the front's hardly great. But that's a conscious design choice I've made in this build. And I see people all the time not embracing the things a case can do for your system. You see, I was designing a build here that was going to be fully color matched in white that I wanted to look the business. Yes, airflow is going to be compromised a little bit, but in exchange for visuals. The Corsair 3500X I've used here allowed me to do that perfectly. So so some good tips so far, but I haven't yet touched on the all-important word. And I'm not talking about bottlenecking, I'm talking about future-proofing. To be clear, in a PC build, the word future-proofing is quite dangerous, because we never know what game's going to come out, what new hardware might one day land, and that makes it actually kind of impossible to future-proof your build from upcoming changes that you don't know about. But there are definitely things you can do to help your build be better now and into the future, and save you money later on, should you ever decide to upgrade your rig. Now, the first is basically 
basic things like making sure your case has enough clearance for larger AIOs and larger graphics cards. I'm not talking about buying the world's biggest case for dual 420mm RADs, but having the option for a 360 is where I would consider as a baseline. You also want to make sure it's got room for slightly larger power supplies should your build ever need a larger PSU. And it's always a good idea to see how much money the power supplier step up from the one you're going to pick actually costs. Take these two Thermaltake smart units, for example, an extra 100 watts might only set you back $10. And that's going to make a big difference should you ever decide you want to overclock or upgrade some of your internal components. Similarly, it can make sense to go for a slightly higher end CPU or go for a platform you know has more longevity now and into the future. That makes things like CPU upgrades a bit easier. And if you're opting, say, for an i5 or a Ryzen 5 CPU, going for a motherboard that you know has enough power delivery for a slightly higher end i7 or i9 can be a great way to upgrade later, especially from an affordability standpoint, as you might be able to pick up the current generation of processor you're currently rocking on the used market in a couple of years at a slightly higher tier. Again, an easy way to upgrade your build without needing to change out motherboard or worse, even the memory too. Now you shouldn't get too carried away when it comes to future proofing. I see people all the time go for 64 gigs of RAM and eight terabytes of storage and a thousand watt power supply only to rock a low end 1080p build. And that is a waste of money. The best gaming PC you can build right now is the one that performs the best for the use case you want in the moment. But especially as you get to the slightly higher price points, 12, 15, $2,000 pounds, that is where you can definitely factor in some upgradability and future proofing for not only now, but in a couple of years time without compromising performance across the rest of your system. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to get subscribed. You can check out Intel's full range of Game of Day deals at the first links in the description below. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.